What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Gage. Welcome to the channel. Today, I am excited to show you my Sakazuki deck profile, arguably the strongest leader in the game currently, and apparently Bandai thinks the same because he is going to be banned within the next month, so I thought I might as well show off the deck, highlight the reasons why it is as powerful as, as it is, uh, before it does end up becoming banned. However, I have built the deck in a way to where it will end up being ban-proof once he actually ends up going because of the fact that Bandai is actually going to be dropping a spiritual successor to Sakazuki with another version of himself that has a nerfed leader ability. Now, by no means is that going to be anywhere near the power level of the current version, but it does mean that you can still play a navy leader that has the blue-black color combination, which is arguably still just so powerful in on itself that you don't necessarily need to have a broken leader ability in order to take advantage of it. So it will be sad for sure. I have been enjoying this deck, and it is by no means an easy deck to pilot. There are a lot of different things that you have to think about when you are making your plays, and I am just excited to show off the build that I am currently running. Without further ado, let's hop into it, and please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. So let's go ahead and look at what Sakazuki does. Why is he so ban-worthy? So he is has the ability where once per turn, you can trash a card from your hand to draw one card. So that is very unassuming, but it is very, very powerful for this deck because you are essentially making it so that you are seeing an extra card every single turn. And obviously consistency in almost every card game is imperative. And this is just an ability that we really don't see very often, just getting access to a free card. Yes, you have to trash a card, but in this deck in particular, trashing isn't as big of a negative drawback as you might think. There are cards that let you add cards back from the trash or even play them from the trash for free, meaning that that card that you trash could end up just being utility later down the line further throughout the course of the game. So yeah, that activate main is just very powerful. There's no other way to say it. And the it also has a respectable when attacking effect where you can give up to one of your opponent's characters minus one cost when you do attack. So it is very versatile. Uh, there's essentially no real drawback to his ability. It is just very, very good and yeah, that's why I, I understand why he has to go, because there are uh, not really too many reasons to play other types of strategies when you have a leader as consistent as this. So to talk about the actual contents of the deck, I am playing four copies of Toshigi, a one cost 2000 power character with a 1000 counter that on play lets you look at the top five cards of the deck, reveal a navy type card other than herself, and add it to the hand. So consistency is key. In the One Piece trading card game, most of the best decks are going to have access to some type of searcher because you want to be able to have uh, power in the type of cards that you have in your hand. So Toshigi being able to search pretty much 90% of the entire deck is just very, very strong. And as I mentioned, you know, most decks, they might not even get their own archetypal searcher, and yet Navy was able to acquire two with brand new. So it is a two cost 3000 power character, 1000 counter that on play looks at the top three cards of the deck and then adds one of those cards and trashes the rest. So while Tashiki bottom decks the others, brand new trashes the others. So he doesn't dig as deep. However, I did allude earlier that your trash really could end up being a resource later down the line. You need cards in your trash to activate certain abilities, and you can get cards from the trash later on. So again, just having a searcher that can also double down as setup is very powerful for this strategy. 
I'm playing four copies of Suru, a very good 2,000 counter uh, character that also has an on-play effect to give one of your opponent's characters minus two cost during the turn. So the overall idea of the deck is to minus your opponent's costs for their characters so that you can then remove those characters later on with some of your other cards. So Tsuru remains to be a very solid option for the deck, along with four copies of Toshigi, a three cost, 4,000 power character that is a 2,000 counter that has the activate main. You can rest her to give one of your opponent's characters minus two cost. So you're going to see the theme. Half of the deck is going to be cards that are minusing your opponent's costs to their characters, whereas the other half is going to be removing them by either KOing characters under a certain cost threshold or putting certain characters with a certain cost threshold under uh, to the bottom of your opponent's deck. So this is a very good 2000 counter because it can also be played later down the line with another card that we will talk about in the deck profile. We are playing four copies of Hina, three cost 5,000 power. And similarly on play, you can give one of your opponent's characters minus four cost. You're getting the gist. You want as many cards as you can to minus your opponent's characters so that you can then remove them later down the line. Hina is yet another one of those cards that can be played later down the line, and she's got respectable stats, so she could end up just being a good attacker in the late game. I'm also playing two copies of Kuzan. I've gone back and forth with three copies, four copies, but I settled with two just because he doesn't really have a counter. You don't want your hand to be clogged with too many cards that don't have counter power. And overall, he's just still solid. Uh, on play, you draw a card, so he replaces himself. And when attacking, it gives uh, you can give one of your opponent's characters minus four cost during the turn. So very rarely does he stick, but your opponent has to respect him. If they are unable to remove him, it just means that you are then going to be able to potentially just minus their cost every single turn, which means that none of their characters are going to be able to stick. So uh, Kuzan is a threat. Uh, as soon as he hits the field, your opponent is going to have to find a way to get rid of him. And that's why I still play two copies. And I am playing his signature move, three copies of Ice Age, one cost uh, event card that uh, essentially allows you to give one of your opponent's characters minus five cost during the turn, making it that much easier for the cards that are able to remove your opponent's cards uh, to be able to make sure that they are gone. Uh, and it also has a solid trigger where it can KO up to one of your opponent's characters with a cost of three or less. So sometimes your opponent might not necessarily see that coming. So if they are swinging at your life, this could end up coming out and actually saving you in a pinch. And now for the removal cards, I am playing four copies of the most busted event in the game in Hound Blaze. It is a two cost event. That says you can give your leader or character plus 3,000 power and then place one of your opponent's characters with a cost of two or less at the bottom of their deck. This is insane. The fact that you not only get the buff, but also can put characters to the to the bottom of your opponent's deck. I mean, look at all the cards that we were able to play that have the capability of minusing your opponent's costs. All of these cards can make it so that essentially your opponent isn't going to be able to have any characters in play, and that's what makes Sakazuki such an oppressive strategy. It also has an okay trigger where you can return up to one of your, uh, up to one character with a cost of three or less to the owner's hand, so this can include your own, uh, but yeah, a lot of the times you're really just going to want to have this in your hand for the option to bottom deck one of your opponent's characters. Additionally, we are playing four copies of the newly uh, newer release cards for the Navy strategy in Amino Murakumo Sword. I think I said that right. Uh, two cost uh, event that says you can place one of your opponent's characters with a cost of two or less and up to one of your opponent's characters with a cost of one or less at the bottom of their deck. So there are going to be opportunities where you can actually bottom deck two of your opponent's characters, and that is 
devastating because your opponent may not be able to have answers or be able to recover from that, being able to swing the tempo of the game in your favor, and that is why I am playing four copies. It also has the trigger effect to activate this card's main effect, so if your opponent isn't seeing, com seeing it coming, if they do have some weaker characters on their side of the field, they might as well say bye-bye to them. And we are playing four copies of Rob Lucci. Just also very strong removal, four cost, 6,000 uh, power. So his stats are respectable. And on play, you can place three cards from your trash to the bottom of your deck in any order to KO up to one of your opponent's characters with a cost of two or less and one of your opponent's characters with a cost of one or less. So obviously, KOing is very strong. Getting rid of your opponent's characters is always going to be key with this deck. Uh, however, uh, there are obviously ways in which your opponent might be able to protect themselves from KOing. So KOing isn't always going to be the option you want to go for, especially in the mirror match in which your opponent might have more answers than others. But yeah, Rob Lucci is still just a very solid attacker in a pinch and uh, you always want to be able to have access to as many cards that can remove your your opponent's characters. I'm also playing three copies of Borsellino, seven cost, 8,000 power. That has the on play to place one of your opponent's characters with a cost of four or less at the bottom of the owner's deck. Obviously, the as you see, the entire theme of the deck is just is saying no to your opponent. If they stick anything, you are more than likely going to be able to remove it. So that is why uh, Borsellino is uh, a namesake for the deck. I can see if you were maybe interested in cutting a copy um, for another card that I will discuss later on, but uh, I the fact that he is searchable is really what makes it uh, more appealing for me. And I am playing four copies of the Black Borsalino, the blocker that is four cost, 5,000 power, and on your opponent's turn, uh, gains 1,000 power and cannot be KO'd by card effects. So this is one of the cards, an example of a card that can get around Rob Lucci's KO effect. The fact that it has protection means that a lot of the times he is sticking to the board. And yes, in opposing mirror matches, your opponent can choose to bottom deck it if they do have the option to do so. But uh, this is just one of the best blockers at, that this deck can produce. And that is why I recommend playing four copies. I'm also playing four copies of Rebecca, a four cost, zero power character that has 1000 count, uh, counter. It is a blocker that on play allows you to add a black character card with a cost of three to seven other than herself from the trash to your hand. And then you can play a black character card with a cost of three or less from your hand rested. Um, she's as broken as she reads. <laughs> the fact that you are able to have such a huge power play in adding back either a 2k counter from your discard pile to your hand. Uh, the card that you add to your hand can also be the card that you end up playing. So that is why Hina is really good because you are most of the time going to be able to see multiple activations of your Hina because you could always just end up playing it back again for free with the Rebecca's effect getting the Hina out into play, and then reducing your opponent's uh, character's cost, and then playing something like one of your removal cards to get rid of it. So now you are up a card in your hand, and you are going to be able, you're recycling a card from the discard pile, um, and you are going to end up playing something for free, and she's a blocker. So uh, yeah, it is just a huge power play that the deck has to offer. The only downside being that she is Dress Rosa, so she is not searchable, but that honestly does not matter because most of the time, because you're playing four, means that you are going to see at least one or two throughout the course of the game. The fact that Sakazuki has the ability to just consistently uh, get that extra draw every single turn means that more than likely than not, you are going to end up seeing Rebecca at some point if she isn't in your opening hand. And so guys, this is not going to be the most optimal uh, option for the deck 
for sure. And that is mostly because the deck is, uh, you know, getting banned that I don't necessarily want to invest into it. But I am playing two copies of Kaido. So this is actually just from a very, very early build from pre um, uh, OPL5 format in which the you were just playing a card that was really meant to be able to help refill your hand and hedge your bets against the yellow matchup. Realistically, these should be Gecko Moria. 100% for budgetary reasons, I am just playing a budget option, but if you want it to be as competitive as possible, playing Gecko Moria is very much the more powerful option uh, because of the fact that it's considered to be the most powerful black card uh, in the game, and arguably the most powerful card in the game. However, I cannot necessarily justify uh, spending that much money on, I think they're about 20 to 25 a piece, um, uh, on playing that when there is more likely than not going to be a chance that that card ends up getting banned in the future, just because of how powerful it is and how splashable it is in other strategies. But there is still an argument for other types of tech cards uh, there are builds that do play the five cost Black Sabo that also allows you to cycle through cards in your hand and provide your board with protection from being KO'd. Honestly, I just love the artwork for the Kaido. I mean, it is just absolutely gorgeous just using that blast breath. And of course, the ability is nothing to scoff at either. Drawing four cards if your opponent has three or less life, which Let's be real, most of the time they will be. A lot of the best leaders in this meta are multicolored, so they're starting at four anyway. And so by the time you get to 10 Dawn, there is a very good chance that they are going to have three or less life, right? So uh, yeah, this is obviously just an early tech from early builds of Sakazuki. Most have very much moved on to playing Gecko Moria. And yes, I admit it is a better card, but for budget constraints, I am happy perfectly happy with the two copies of Kaido that I do have. So guys, that is going to be it for the deck profile. Hopefully this allowed you to see exactly why Sakazuki is as much of a menace as he is. It's going to be sad to see him go. However, we are at least getting the uh, replacement, the spiritual successor in uh, another copy of Sakazuki, but with just a nerfed leader effect. Uh, definitely got to give a shout out to Kaizoku cards to making some of the best proxies for these leaders and other cards uh, in, in the trading card, in the One Piece trading card game space. So definitely check them out if this is uh, a, a card that piques your interest. Uh, has I, I've been shopping from him for a long, long time, and I can vouch for his products for sure. So thank you so, so much for listening if you are still uh, watching this video. And until next time, take care.